Hey everybody, welcome back to this series where I go through various RPG products that I have and give them a quick flip through and review. In this one, I'm going to be doing three adventures for the Shadow Dark RPG. All three of these adventures are free. So you guys should go out right now and download them. I'll put links below to where you should get them. They're all great. All very good adventures. They're all very different, but they're all excellent in different ways. So I'm going to be covering them one at a time, go through them uh, briefly. The first two are pretty short, the third one is a lot longer. So I'll go through these uh, as quickly as I can to give you a sense of what they are. The first one I'm going to cover is The Unbroken City, an adventure source book. This is written by Paul Dean, and I think it was submitted to the um, Game Jam that Baron de Rop did on his channel a few months ago. Um, I think it came in, I don't know, maybe the top 30, top 40? I don't know exactly where it came. But it, it's a great adventure, and I think it deserves to get probably higher than it got, <laughs> at least in my opinion. I know they did a ranking, but I really like this one, and I think it's really, really good. Um, I think he did all of the art himself and all the design himself, so it's a real labor of love, and it's a great adventure. This, the idea behind The Unbroken City is that you are in this city that's just been conquered by a dragon and her horde, and now it's up to you to sort of resist and to try to do what you can. So you're given a, bre a breakdown of the city, an overview of what's been going on, um, how to use this book, uh, motivations for the various underground movements, and then the general atmosphere of the city, along with points of interest and the areas of authority. So you have a brief rundown of the adventure as a whole. Then you get the plots that are having uh, happening in the city. Um, you can twist them or not. So you can use the complication or not as you see fit. In the rallying Christ, you've got to kind of get the people um, going and there is a, uh, a former princess or the daughter of the previous ruler who is maybe still alive and maybe she's actually working for the bad guys depending on how you want to run it. You can run it both ways. Um, try to get the shield of the dragon slayer. Um, try to find the, the forgotten temple or rather try to uh, um, stop what's actually going on there. Um, because it's just one of the reasons for the conquest. It says, you know, the temple district has been of particular interest to Malthrax and her horde. For the past ten days, the temples have been defiled, the crypts open, broken open, statues of gods and heroes toppled. At first, we believed it was despite the gods, but now we believe they are looking for something. Right? So there's something going on beneath that. Missing supplies, establishing outposts, crashing the gates. So lots of different things there. Now you have the horde itself with some great NPCs and creatures and interesting motivations for them. Um, notes about them and what stats you should use. Um, and also kind of just ideas about maybe how they might compete with each other or, or where they might, you know, ways of uh, just very brief ideas about how you might use one against another. Again, very briefly in their personality and motivations and all that. So you get some monsters and some people within the city who have sort of turned on the city, at least one. Then you get the underground. This is, this is the resistance, the people that you're going to be working with. Some are more noble, some are less noble, right? <laughs> they, they, some are interested in saving the city, some are interested in kind of making some money. Uh, but they're all interesting uh, people, all people that you're going to try to, uh, to work with and, and, and will help you or hinder you, depending on what you do. Then you get random encounters, um, events that can occur, city encounters, stashes, artifacts, and uh, the combat encounters and how you run them, along with some descriptions, briefly. And then the stats for all the monsters in this book, briefly broken down, along with some additional charts and an <laughs> a shameless self-promotion. So it's a very simple little booklet. It's free, and you're gonna have to do some of the work yourself, obviously, but I tend to prefer those documents. This is it, it's eight pages. But eight pages with a great idea, which I don't think has been done enough, this idea that you're in a city, it's an urban adventure, but it's sort of more of an urban campaign. And you're going to be trying to you know, fight for the people of the city, trying to over, you know, overcome the enemy, stay hidden, go underground, go into the hidden temple, find the supplies. It's a cool, a cool idea, a really cool idea. And if you're interested in running a shorter campaign uh, set in a city that's been conquered by a, a dragon and her horde, highly recommend this one, The Unbroken City. Um, it deserves some love. The next one is also very short also only eight pages. It doesn't even have a title page or a cover page. This is called The Ruins of the Immortal Warlord. It's a short third level dungeon crawl. Now, the, it's really simple. It's really straightforward, but I wanted to highlight a couple things about it because I wish more dungeons were designed this way. There's a little dungeon map and I'll talk about it. So essentially you have this ruin on top of a uh, island in the middle of the lake and there are um, pirates and Sahagin and then the flame guard who are sort of uh, what, wyverns and things like that. Um, or wyvern have nests along the lake. And so you have some rumors there about what you're 
you're looking at and how to, how to approach this place. This is what I mean. This little simple piece of art. So you show the bottom one to your players and then the top one is your map. And what I love about this is essentially you can approach this dungeon from so many different ways. There are windows, you can climb up to the top of the tower, you can go to either of these uh, entrances, there's a broken ceiling. There's just so many different ways of approaching this adventure. It's only a handful of rooms, but you can approach it in almost any from almost any direction. And so you're going to have a much more interesting uh, encounter. You can, you can you don't, It's not gonna be the same every time. You can run this a few times. Um, but even when you're preparing it, it's going to be new. I think that's awesome. Um, you know, you're not going to be able to prepare exactly how the, the sequence of the adventure. So I, w I just wanted to highlight it because I think, you know, more dungeons should be designed this way. Super cool. Um, you get a breakdown very simply of the encounters, the random encounters of Thor, light, danger level, and walls. And then a brief description which follows the usual and I think very excellent Shadow Dark format for how to present information. Bolding, bullet points, and... Uh, it just divided up that way. Some hyperlinks even for pages, for page numbers, which is a cool idea. You click on the hyperlink, you go right to the page. Um, guard room, chapel, prison, North Shore. Now, I'm not gonna say that this is the best adventure I've ever read in terms of just like super crazy and incredible. It's, it's really straightforward. I just wanted to highlight that map because I think it's awesome. It gives it right to you right away. There's a cool uh, thing going on here. There's some interesting um, ideas with chess pieces and then there's some, uh, ideas with, you know, a little bit of faction play going on. There's some cool magic items going on here. Not very much of those things. Um, but you get uh, brief breakdowns of all the different monsters. Uh, the special ones for this particular adventure, Buccaneer, Yuki, the Shrouded, the Dragon, Blood, Flame Guard, and the Warlord, Hechikawa of the Black Rain, along with the Blade of the Five Seals, and the Sheath of Five Seals, and then some new weapons which are found here. So pistols, muskets, blunderbusses, cannons, cannonballs, grenades, and harpoons. So that's it. That's the whole thing. Eight simple pages. But I wanted to highlight it because really it's that second, it's this page. I just love it. I don't know. It's, it's Maybe it's just simple because it's a very simple map. It's, it's, it's isometric, which I like. Um, and it has a sort of amateurish look that isn't bad. I don't mean amateurish in a really bad way. It's It looks like something that a really good cartographer would draw in their notebook for their home game. That's probably what it was. And I love that. I think that's really cool. I just like that vibe. Um, but simply that you see what's in the room and you can approach these from lots of different locations. Uh, I love that. And I wish more dungeons did this. And again, this is free, so you can pick this up. Even if you don't run this particular adventure, just download it because, you know, you get some extra uh, items and you get some cool stat blocks. Uh, and I actually think it's a cool little adventure. If you're going to run a quick third level dungeon crawl, you can throw this at your players as a one shot and it'd be great. But you could stick it into a bigger campaign if you wanted as well. The Unbroken City is much more of like a we're going to play a campaign in a city. This one you could throw into any campaign or run it as a one-night event. The last one that I wanted to cover is The Count, The Castle, and The Curse by R.B. Bo. This is similarly pay what you want on Drive Through RPG. Now this one's a little bigger. The PDF is 42 pages. And this is essentially a take on Ravenloft or Curse of Strahd. The castle as it's presented here is basically the same castle as you get in Curse of Strahd, but it's done in an awesome, awesome way. It obviously takes inspiration, at least I think it takes inspiration from, uh, in terms of its design and how it's laid out, from um, The Waking of Willoughby Hall by Ben Milton over at Questing Beast. It has a similar influence in, in the way that it's laid out, in the way that the rooms are laid out to each other, uh, and the way that the maps are designed. Now it's, well, you'll see it. It's a great adventure. Here is the map of the dungeon. And this is this is the sort of detail you're given about each of the locations in terms of just on the map. You're not given a hex grid. You're not given, um, uh, sorry, I keep saying hex grids in these videos when I mean square grids. <laughs> you're not given five foot increments of where things are in relation to each other. You're not given distances between rooms. That's up to you to describe as the players are moving. Instead, you're given sort of a point crawl of the whole keep. And it's a really great way of doing it. You know, it, the more I studied this adventure and the more I've read through it, the more I think this is probably the better way to do a, a dungeon like Ravenloft than what I was sort of doing in my Shadow Dark uh, Ravenloft conversion videos, where I just sort of take it from the 5e and shift it over to this. A point crawl is probably a better idea. And I think ultimately you're gonna end up doing something like this anyway. But anyway, here is the map of Ravenloft, or, or the, the castle, which it's not called anything, but it's very clearly the castle, as you'll see as you go through. If you're familiar with Ravenloft, you'll, you'll recognize that this is pretty much the same exact place. 
Um, there's some there's some changes, and some of the names have been changed. It's not Strahd von Zarevich, it's just the Count. But Sergei is in here, and the backstory has been shifted a bit. Um, now, one of the things that this game does is it has a stress level, and this is a mechanic that you could certainly do away with if you wanted, but as written, it plays a pretty key role in the adventure. So there are several new rules for this game. Here is on the front few pages, just quick breakdown of some of the special things that's happening in this adventure. One is escalating encounters. So um, as you go through the dungeon, you have a chance of running into these particular named characters. The Other Witch, the Count's Animated Armor, Dorothy, the Spider Queen, Sister Geraldine, the Fallen Nun, Christina, the Seductress, and the Count himself. And every time you encounter one of these, you, you have a sort of sequence, and you'll see this later, that there's four escalations that occur. So the first time you encounter them, you encounter the first one. Then the second time, it's the second. The third time, it's the third. And then finally, you kind of meet them at the fourth one. And they're all dangerous, or they're not all dangerous, but different things happen in each one that kind of make an interesting encounter that all build up to the final encounter with the creature. It's a cool way of doing it. Um, so instead of just having lots of random encounters, you have set encounters that are moving about the castle, and you just get kind of uh, encounters that are related to them that escalate in importance and in danger until you finally meet them. It's a cool way of doing it. But th you also do have set encounters, monsters that are in rooms and things like that. Another thing that this game is doing is you have a stress level. Stress level is always revealed to the players, so you have a little indicator of what the stress level is, and it determines basically the checks and the ACs of everything that you're dealing with. So essentially every monster has an armor class that's equal to the stress level. Every DC that you need to roll to pass in a room is related to the stress level. So as the stress level goes up, the game gets harder, and as the stress level goes down, the game gets easier. So it's built into, he talks about it a little bit, that um, you, it's sort of a built-in way of, of mimicking the fear feeling. Because it's really easy, it's really hard, it's really hard I should say, to build in a sort of fear system that's not just mechanical and that, that doesn't connect in any way to the players actually being stressed or, or afraid. This is a way of actually making the stress level relate to their stress level. So the, the higher it goes, the more stressed they will be because it's harder for them to succeed. It also, now one of my criticisms here is that it's one of those circumstances where as it gets harder, it gets harder faster, right? So um, it's sort of a bad spiral. If you start to roll badly, then you'll see that uh, if, if things start to go wrong for you, your stress level goes up, and then things are going to go more wrong for you because it's harder for you to succeed, so your stress level is going to go up faster. And so it, it's just one of those things where I think it, it, you're probably going to end up on the very stressed side of things. Uh, but I suppose it could happen the other way too, where if you happen to get really lucky, then things get easier and easier, and you're going to succeed at more things, and therefore it will be easier. So anyway, it's, it's an interesting mechanic. I like the idea behind it. I don't know how it would actually work out in-game. I'd be willing to try it, though, and I'm, I'm sure it could be fun. I think it would have the effect that he intends, which is to make players pay a lot of attention and become more stressed as the stress level goes up. But, you know, we'll see if that would actually turn, to, turn out to be a fun mechanic at the table. It's one thing for a mechanic to make sense and work, and another thing for it to be fun. Uh, there are different ways of escaping the castle. That's kind of the idea, is you're trying to escape. And there's five ways of doing it, and they're all kind of key lock systems. So you have to, you can find the, that this is a way out, but then you've got to do something in order to, to use it. So you can't just stumble on the exit and leave, which I like. Um, there are five different ways of, of, of getting out, though. And then finally, one of the things that's going on here is that you're becoming a vampire. You've been bitten already, kind of before the adventure begins. And so you can kind of... Uh, give into it. I think there's some influence here from Darkest Dungeons, the Red Curse, or the Crimson Curse um, idea, which is one of those expansions, um, where you have that blood curse and you can kind of give into it for powers, but weaknesses can start to come true. And if you give into it too much, then really bad things happen to you. Now, this is what I mean by the design. You'll see more of this, but there's the yesterday, this evening, and moments ago, which I love. I think that's a great way of presenting information uh, in the background of your adventure. Yesterday this happened, this evening this happened, and then moments ago that happened. And essentially you were invited to this castle, you showed up, and a bunch of you all showed up at the same time. You realize you've all been invited together, you went in for dinner, and then you were attacked in the darkness, and you wake up afterwards in the cells. And you've been bitten, and you have to try to find your way out. Now one of the things that this does, because this is designed for Shadow Dark, it wants to use the real-time mechanic. And so it says a sort of four to five hour one-shot um, is how it's structured, and you should set it as an actual timer that that's the amount of time before midnight. 
and at midnight, bad stuff happens. You have a little bit of a chance. Once midnight happens, you have a little little window to escape if you're about to, basically. If you're right at the edge, you can maybe get out. But if you're, if you're not right at the edge, you're not going to escape, and that's basically it. So midnight is when the count comes to really kill you. Up till then, he's going to give you a chance to get out. He's kind of playing with you, but if you're still there at midnight, he's going to kill you. So that's built into the timer. So, all right, guys, we're going to play until... You know, we're going to play until X time, and at that point, that's actually midnight in game. So it says, you know, make sure the players know that when it comes to go taking bathroom breaks or taking a break. Make sure they know that they're actually playing on the timer. Again, I think you could ignore that, but it might be interesting to try it with this sort of adventure. It kind of plays with the real-time element of some of the Shadow Dark mechanics, which I think is cool. And then he talks about the different mechanics here and how stress works. Um, essentially, there are ways for it to go up and go down. You, you probably have to have this page open to keep track of it because there's a lot of ways for it to go up and a lot of ways for it to go down. Um, so you really need to kind of keep track of this, I think. Um, but it's pretty cool. I like this system. It, I've always said, no, I said this in my other videos, but you need a kind of stress system in a horror game of any kind, and, and I think this is a good, a good attempt. Um, again, I'd like to see how it actually would work out. But I think it would do what he's trying to do with it, which is increase the player dread rather than just the character dread. Then you have progressive vampirism and vampiric traits and weaknesses. This is great. This is really, really great. So as you can sort of choose at first if you want to give into it, but the more you give into it, you get benefits. But the more you give into it, the harder it is to resist it. And so you start to have these other benefits that are going on. Really interesting. And then if you do it too much, well, if you do it too much, it's not great. <laughs> Uh, your the monster inside takes over and you you lose essentially your character dies or becomes forfeit you become a monster so even if you make it out it doesn't really you don't really make it out something you can find are trinkets from home they can lower your stress level and they can give you some hit points it's a way of you know giving you quick hit points um, as long as you have it you get an extra boost to your hit points so it's a way of maybe mitigating some of the danger of this place as you can find these trinkets which boost you along and keep you going a little bit. Um, then you get treasure and then death and die. And, and the idea is you're not going to die before midnight. So he says, you know, if you have, uh, if you die to a monster, then the players find you later. You know, you're not actually dead. You're kind of whimpering. <laughs> um, um, and uh, if you if you think you're dead, it turns out you haven't actually died. You've been, you know, just reduced to half your maximum hit points. And, um, but then, of course, if it, at midnight, the count gets you. That's it. So you're not going to die before the end. Again, you could ignore this. And I think a lot of tables might ignore this and just let you die off. But this is one way of, of proceeding. So you make sure you play the whole adventure. It's the idea of escalating encounters, as I said, um, and how they work. And then at the stroke of midnight, what happens? You, you kind of have a chance to get out, but probably not going to. Now here's the castle layout. And, and it's, it's interesting because, as I said before, it's laid out as sort of a point crawl. And you're given... Um, kind of this way or that way indications. Now, there are, there are sometimes there are secret doors, but they're not very common. Most of the time, it's this way or that way. Um, then, again, the five different ways of escaping and then the artifacts you can find. Now, at this point, you'll see the Count's Tome, the Mother's Icon, and the Sun Sword. Those are the three icons, the three relics that you get in uh, Curse of Strahd. And it'll keep going. You can see it's a combination. It's basically taking straight from Curse of Strahd in a lot of ways. Stats and conversions and things to do. Hit points should be lowered and uh, stress levels shouldn't be connected to the hit points. They are connected to DCs and to AC. It says you, you can use it for Shadow Dark, but you can use it for any, any game with minimal stats. So it's OSR, generally. You start off in the Flooded Dungeon. You start with maximum hit points, no weapons, armor, or spell components. But you do have Holy Symbols if you're a Cleric, for example or a priest. Um, talks about cantrips and spells. If you cast them with a, if they have a verbal component, you have to be careful because that can, you'll roll an encounter check. And it says a player should be warned ahead of time. Your description of the dungeon and the layout of these is really good. Um, bullet, bolding and bullet points and italics um, to try to keep your attention on the various, you know, draw your attention to the various places that are important here. Um, you start off in the dungeon, there's a guy there with uh, an old man with a tarot deck, and he gives you your fortune, which is a way of giving you information about what you have to do in the dungeon. It's similar to, you know, Ravenloft I-6 or Curse of Strahd. But instead of having it be Madame Eva, outside the castle, it's just a guy in the cells. Now, here is where you see the kind of map that this game uses. You start off in the flooded dungeon, and you can go to the torture chamber, or you can go to this 
catacombs if you find the secret door and do the right thing for it. It tells you the page number that you have to go to to go to that location. And uh, when it describes on the, in the description of the room, it tells you what page you have to go to there as well. So for example, the stone balcony, if you read all the way to the end, it says stairs behind the curtain lead up to the larders, page 15. So you know exactly where you gotta go. It's a really great system. You have on the page where you are and what's connected to it. So you can very easily see where the players can go and the page numbers for if they do go there. So it's so easy to use. This, this document is so easy to use. It's a masterclass, just like I think The Waking of Willoughby Hall in an ease of use. But this one, instead of having the map laid out, uh, you know, room to room the way that Willoughby Hall does, you're kind of doing a point crawl system. But just as easy to use, I think. This would be a joy to use at the table. You could play this without, with very little prep ahead of time. And it's all basically right here for you. Now, one thing is I would say this leans a bit more into the gruesome side of things than uh, Curse of Strahd or even Ravenloft I-6 do. Um, that in that, there's a lot that's hinted at rather than directly said in ba about bad things having happened to people and gruesome ways of dying and, and the victims and what happened to them. This one kind of just lays it out. So, you know, keep that in mind. If you're more interested in, uh, in being, um, you know, less... It's disgusting at times. You might want to hold back some of the descriptions of, of what's happening in these in some of these rooms. Just some of them. It's not it's not really all that awful most of the time, but sometimes it's pretty disturbing. Meant to be scary. Um, the crypts are just like the crypts from Curse of Strahd and Ravenloft in that there's some silly things there. Um, but there are just a few of them instead of all of them, right? Just a few of them. That's one way of running that big room. And then you can go to the tomb of the brother, whose name is Sergei, <laughs> and he has one of the possible ways of getting out. And then there is the uh, the count and the count's tomb. So this is the brother's tomb, where again there's one way of getting out. Now this is one thing actually I'm not so sure about. The count, or the um, the brother's tomb has a balcony outside, and it's only a 50 foot drop to the nearest rocky ledge. It's actually not that far, and I think if players start off with I don't know, feather fall. I don't know why they can't just use that. I mean, I guess they don't have their book, but in Shadow Dark, do you need your book to cast your spell? So say you happen to be a wizard who happens to find this exit. I mean, granted, you do have to defeat the ghost. Um, but you uh, you don't have to. I mean, yeah, you, you, have to, you can either find your way past it or you can uh, destroy it. If you destroy it and you got lucky, you could just jump out right away. So this is the one exit that I think... Maybe 50 feet is not enough. Maybe you should make it like 200 just to make it more dangerous. But, you know, if you make it 200, then they can't find rope and get out this way because that's probably too far. So anyway, it's something to consider. 50 feet doesn't seem like that far. Now, granted, if you just jump out 50 feet, you're going to die. But, um, you know, if they have some minor way of, of figuring that out, if they gather, gather all the bed sheets up in the, the rooms upstairs, the tablecloths, and come back here and tie them together, could they just escape that way? Yeah, maybe. And you might let them do that. Um, the Count's tomb himself. And uh, you can see the empty coffins here, the Count's brides, and uh, what happens if you have defeated them elsewhere, you can come and find them here. But then if you go the other way again, back through the larders, you kind of find your way up. And I just think it's a great adventure. There's a lot of really cool, really creepy moments. But as you go up, you'll recognize you're kind of reading through Curse of Strahd in a very different way or at least in reading through Ravenloft in a very different way. Um, there is a cool cauldron room. Uh, it's a way of getting out. There's essentially a sort of riddle here. Not a riddle, but a song. Um, and the sort of um, ingredients you need in order to make a potion that will teleport you out. And so you can make a... Um, you can drink a, po uh, a, uh, a way of getting out of the uh, dungeon. <laughs> Which is cool. Uh, and if you wish to flee the castle, this is what you need to do to get there. You have to collect a bunch of things, figure out kind of the, not necessarily the, uh, a riddle, but a sort of a riddle, and bring it all back here, make a potion, and drink it. Then there's the wolf's witch's kitchen, which is a really cool encounter. There's a priest who's, it's a giant kitchen. There's a giant hand making food, horrible food, and there's a, a cauldron that's massive, and there's a floating potato in it, and boiling and there's a priest holding onto the potato trying not to fall into the soup and he said help me you know um and so you can try to save him and defeat this witch it's a great encounter it's awesome um 
and then you get the foyer and the rest of the castle. And as you read through it, you'll again see that it's pretty much, it's connected the way that the map from Curse of Strahd is connected, so, or the map of Ravenlock is connected. So the foyer connects to the Living Gate, the organ room, the Desecrated Chapel, the Audience Hall upstairs, the King's, the Desecrated Chapel is connected to the King's Balcony. I mean, again, if you, if you know that adventure, you'll know that this is a take on it. Um, a really good one, too. I think it's a really good one. Um, now the organ room, you have this uh, sort of encounter with the, uh, with the, well, the Count himself. You can fight him if you'd like. You don't have to, of course. Um, here's the chapel, and you have the, uh, the same thing. There's a crumpled figure in front of it, just like there is in Ravenloft and in Shadow Dark. I mean, sorry, in, uh, in uh, Curse of Strahd, I should say. The Living Gate, this is one of the ways out. This is another one where I feel like there might be a way um, to get out. Uh, maybe not. Maybe you could just describe it as like you can't climb over the wall or something like that. Maybe it's just the actual doors to the castle. There's no way out other than, you know, by climbing over them or something like that. But, but yeah, certainly something there. Um, I know, basically, it's just a bunch of really good uh, takes on the the standard <laughs> Ravenloft idea um, with cool encounters in each of these different rooms. Some of them kind of creepy, some of them kind of interesting, um, but I think they'll all be engaging. And the the keys that are that are necessary in order to open up any of the ways out are scattered around a lot of this castle. So you're going to have to go to specific places and probably explore a lot of the castle, regardless of which one you kind of stumble across or your players stumble across and decide to use. Um, there's a couple NPCs that you can run into and uh, can help help you out in this rest of this... Uh, well, help you or hinder you, um, as the case may be. The Hidden Bell Free, um, which you need to use... Uh, you need to ring the bell in order to get some, some interesting things to happen. There's the Hall of Heroes. One of these... So this is a little meta. One of these... Um, statues in the Hall of Heroes is of the player, not of the character. <laughs> it says specifically the player. Um, some players, some tables might not like that. If you're playing this as a one-shot, I mean, kind of scary, you could totally do that. I think it'd be fun, but some people might not enjoy that. So you know, again, there's some things you might change just based on what your table would like um, or what you as a DM like. So, you know, consider that. Um, and uh, eventually you can get up to the, te the rooftops. There's a giant raven up here who offers to carry you out if you bring her um, what needs to be brought out. And then of course, in the, the highest peak of the tower peak, there's the beating heart, which is the uh, you know, very familiar if you know the Ravenloft adventure. If you destroy it, you can get out through the main gate. Um, you can find the sun sword, which is a very powerful item uh, for Shadow Dark here. But uh, it really, in any game, it's a very powerful item. In 5e, it's presented as a very powerful item. That's basically it for the dungeon. And then you get the escalating encounters, and you sort of get the other witch, and uh, the order of encounters, if you, if you roll for that encounter. And then there's the Count's animated armor, the Spider Queen, uh, Sister Geraldine, Christina, and then the Count himself. Finally, you get the last pages here. Um, and the, uh, just a silhouette of the castle on the last page. So this is a fantastic adventure. It's a great take on Ravenloft and on the Curse of Strahd. I think it's really good. I highly recommend it, especially if you're interested in running Ravenloft as more of a one-shot. Try something like this. It's not going to have the same exact tone as, uh, as an adaptation, a straight adaptation of Ravenloft I-6 or of Curse of Strahd, which is what I'm doing with my players. This is just the castle. It's not Barovia as a whole. It gets right, to, you know, cuts right to the chase. You're here. You're at the castle. You're in the crypts how you're going to escape. So it's a different sort of adventure than running I-6 or running um, Curse of Strahd. But I think it gets the same idea down if you want to run through a big castle, gothic horror castle with a lot of creepy undead and a lot of puzzles to figure out and riddles to solve, and you want to play it for Shadow Dark or for any OSR game, this is a great one. And again, it's free. You can go get it on DriveThruRPG, and I'll put the link below to where you can get all three of these. So The Count, The Castle, and The Curse... A fantastic adventure in the gothic horror genre. Ruins of the Immortal Warlord. I love the design of the dungeon, and I wish more people designed it that way. And then the Unbroken City is a great short campaign for a more urban adventure with a, an evil dragon horde. That's really cool. Anyway, I hope this has been interesting. 
and uh, I'll see you guys in another one.